All right, we are uh, here in the uh, Beaver County Audio Auto Studio um, here in downtown Pittsburgh. This is John Krasinski. It's been a while. Uh, the Pittsburgh Soccer Show is back. Uh, we have a new year, and we have a very special guest here tonight. Uh, Mark Goodman has uh, been kind enough to jo join us. Uh, Mark is, uh, has been a contributor uh, with me uh, at, at Pittsburgh Soccer Now uh, for about six months now. We are very, very happy to have Mark on board with us um, as part of our, our team at Pittsburgh Soccer Now. And he's, his contributions have been invaluable so far uh, from Riverhounds coverage to also just doing a series on youth soccer and, and a little bit of everything else. He's, it's been wonderful to have you with us, Mark. So uh, welcome to the studios tonight. Thanks, John. I'm really enjoying being in Pittsburgh. We were talking before about how Pittsburghers are like New Yorkers in the sense that they have such pride in the place that they live that if you go to New York and you don't immediately agree that it's the greatest place on earth, then they, they really like want you to leave immediately. They don't, they don't like it. And Pittsburgh is the same. It's like but it, in a nicer way. People are very excited to bring somebody new into the fold of the uh, Three Rivers area, and uh, it's been a blast being here. And, and this, learning the soccer scene in town has been fantastic also. Yeah, I mean, you've been a lot of places. You've, I believe, you've been in California. You've been in D.C. and You obviously lived in Colorado before you came to Pittsburgh. So you were talking about the soccer scene, but first, before we kind of dive into that and then we get into some of our topics, which is, you know, obviously we're here in the off season, uh, maybe just talk a little bit about your first six months here and kind of what, what makes this place unique and, and what you like about it. Well, so uh, in my other working life, I'm a, I'm a working rabbi. Uh, I'm the rabbi for Erie, Pennsylvania. So it's a nice little drive up the highway, especially when there's less than five feet of snow on the highway. Um, and that's been uh, a real joy. Uh, the Pittsburgh Jewish community is, is a lovely one to be part of. And then, you know, right when we got here, we made sure to find a soccer club and uh, get my uh, eight-year-old onto a team. And, of course, a week after I signed up, they said, hey, does anyone want to coach? And so I wound up coaching. <laughs> that's a given. If you know anything about the sport, it's like you're, you're, you're sucked in. Yeah, and then, and then you know, we, we quickly learned that uh, you are going to have to learn how to play in mud. Like that's mm -hmm. just a – it you know, it – it, there was just a thing on the news yesterday that Pennsylvania had the most recorded rain in um, 2018 in forever, or maybe of all time. And, you know, you knew it as a soccer coach because there were parts of the field where it was like, okay, don't drive into the right corner because it's just a giant mud puddle and you're going to fall down and lose the ball. So that was a tactical adjustment that a new guy from Colorado had to make. And then when I was in Colorado um, before here, that's where I got the kind of soccer writing bug. Um, I was uh, a big fan of the Colorado Rapids, mm -hmm. my local website said, hey, we're looking for someone who can write. And I noticed that at least three quarters of the people who wrote for the website could barely spell and probably wrote two articles and then quit. So I was like, I can do better than that. <laughs> I have a high school education. Mm -hmm. I can I can spell. So, um, you know, I wound up writing and then I was an editor and I had a press pass for the Colorado Rapids of Major League Soccer for a couple of years. And, um, you know, before that, the soccer bug hit when I was young. I went to the 94 World Cup. When I lived in Israel, uh, I went to the local um, Israeli national team games and the the uh, uh, Premier League, Israeli Premier League, Liga, Liga Ta Al um, matches. So, you know, soccer runs deep in the blood, but uh, I'm really excited to be part of uh, this community here with Pitt, with Duquesne, uh, with USL, with the youth clubs, with uh, Whippeal. Is that how you should be proper? Yes. Or Whippeal. Yeah, Whippeal that's, that's is how someone pronounced it, yeah. it right? Mm -hmm. So I'm learning all about the soccer scene here. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, and you know, like I said, your your contributions have been fantastic. Um, you know, like you said, you, you mentioned a couple of things that you actually covered a pit game, I believe, at one point. You've you've done the youth uh, soccer series, and I think it's great to have someone, an outsider, coming into our area <laughs> and taking a look at all the youth programs here that we have and how it's set up and how Western Pennsylvania work, you know, things work here a little bit. So you've done a profile on a few programs so far, yeah. so a few clubs, but w as we move into the new year, you know, the, we're, you said, I know we're 
we're looking at some more potential um, stories about some clubs in this area. Yeah, well, it, the the youth seems really interesting. As is always the case, it's like two different universes: the boys' mm-hmm. game and the girls' game. Um, and then you know, with youth soccer, there's also the entire separate animal that is high school soccer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you you've got all those things running together. It's it's an interesting question. A lot of people who read about soccer or are interested in soccer are interested in basically the U.S. national team setup. They're interested in who's going to make it to the pros. They want to know who the next Messi is, who the next Pulisic is. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting challenge, I think, for guys like you or me who like soccer and who have kids also um, because we may have a, a perspective that is – What's a good soccer club for my kid, even if my kid is not going to be the next Ronaldo? Um, and I think that that's one thing I bring to it, that it's important for parents to be able to manage the expectation levels of youth soccer. Do I want my kid to have fun? Do I want my kid to build skills, to build confidence? Or do I want my kid to really be on the most elite ch- team and be challenged by the best soccer players? Um, and, you know, knowing the landscape, when I moved to Colorado, uh, there's no real clear way of figuring that stuff out. You kind of talk to some other parents and you show up at a at a club and you plunk down $65 and you buy a uniform and you cross your fingers, you know. And hopefully through the efforts that I put together and through a little bit of research, we might suss out a little bit more what the soccer scene looks like here. It wasn't that hard. Um, most soccer communities are similar in that there are some top end high level very good teams that you know have tryouts and they're extremely competitive and uh, and more mid mid mid-level teams where they do have tryouts but everybody knows that there's a better shot for the more average soccer player to make it and then there's you know kind of teams where basically they want everyone to participate and if you have a really elite kid that's great but um that, that kid may be, you know, the star on the team as opposed to the first guy off the bench for another club. Yeah, and, you know, having been here for about 30 years myself and seeing kind of the, the arc of, of how things have developed in western Pennsylvania, you know, th- there's been it, – it's kind of gone along with the way things have gone nationally, I'd say, but uh, it's prodding along. It's just a little bit slower than everyone else. Um, And I think one of the biggest things that we are lacking is having an immediate area for developmental academy or something on that level, a higher, higher level. As as you were in Colorado, I'm sure the Rapids had... uh, they had a pretty good program. Yeah, the Rapids have a fully funded academy, so everybody on the senior academy uh, teams, so that's their... U13, U15, U17, U18, and U19 teams are going for free. Their hotel stay in Houston is free. They play against all the other best development academy teams. Um, The other thing that the Rapids have slowly done over the last couple uh, years is they now can look at the other really good clubs in town and poach their best players. Mm -hmm. And they have relationships with clubs like Real Colorado and Colorado Rush, um, who were affiliated with um, FC Penn. Um, uh, may its memory be a blessing. Um, <laughs> they um, they previously could previously the City Islanders, are right? Of course. Uh, um, know, yeah. you got to re- yeah, reaching back into history. Yeah. But the thing that they could do was that they could go to the club director and say, "Hey, you got this kid. He's really talented. We like to have him." And you and I both know that his best shot for a professional contract is with us and not with you. And those clubs would would give up those players. They weren't trying to. Um, you know, be the best team in Colorado. They were trying to be the best developmental program for those kids. And to be able to say, we developed this kid for five years. Here you go, Colorado Rapids. Good luck with them is really good. The Colorado Rapids have now signed three players to their senior team in the last three years who came from other clubs and signed on in the last year or two um, with the Rapids. And so that's a nice little uh, arc Um, I know that here in Western Pennsylvania that exists a little bit with the Philadelphia Union and with D.C., that some kids from out here will wind up with those academies. But And Columbus. Right, but it's not a straight shot. uh, And it's it's better if you have 
a direct development academy. The Riverhound Deve Development Academy is the has hopes of of kind of going in that direction, um, but they've they've got to get a little bit better, and they've they've got to kind of crack their way into the next tier of the youth development system here in the United States. Definitely, and the Riverhounds, um, you know, have developed relationships with. The Columbus crew, but it's not exclusive because we've seen players from the Riverhound Youth Development Academy actually go over to DC United as well. So, so there's some different um, challenges um, for for sure. All right. So, uh, in terms of uh, you know the youth and developmental academies, we could <clears throat> probably talk all day because it's it's certainly um, a fascinating subject. We've written a lot about it on Pittsburgh Soccer. Now, I actually wish sometimes I get in, I get a lot of requests. That you know, for more um, material along those lines. So we certainly will work on that. Um, but the, the big topic that you and I uh, have spent some time during the USL offseason, um, we both had an opportunity to sit down and have a very long conversation with the Pittsburgh Riverhounds head coach, Bob Lilly. And really, he's the guy in an organization like that that wears a lot of hats. Um, he's beyond being the head coach. He has influence and, and now going into his second year has really helped turn the franchise around is going to have a lot of say in a lot of things that happen within the organization and sp especially in uh, player procurement. Um, and he essentially serves as a general manager of the team as well. Um, and you and I both discovered that, especially when sitting down with him talking about uh, personal uh, personnel moves and what players he was going to keep in terms of that, um, you know, which uh, players that they would option, uh, they would exercise their options on, which players they would try to sign for an additional year and all of that. But uh, I wanted to kind of talk about, uh, so some of the things in the off season. both you and I have written uh, about this and you most recently uh, wrote a story called Bob the Builder. Uh, t titled Bob the Builder on uh, Pittsburgh Soccer Now, and um, you talked about a, an array of different things, but maybe um, just first talk about kind of what your impressions were of, of Coach Lilly. Yeah, well, you, you said it really well for starters, which is you, you had a long talk with yeah. Bob Lilly. <laughs> Bob is an amazingly generous guy with his time that he's willing to sit down with you and, and talk. He loves to talk about soccer, and he will just do it all day long. Um, he's also – he just has a, a thousand ideas a minute, and so he's throwing all this stuff at you. And, you know, I I got, I think, a uh, an hour and 40 minutes uh, recorded, and I only wound up needing to transcribe, like, 45 of it for the article because we went in so many other directions that I'm saving some material for another article or two down the road if I need it. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. that's a Bob Lilly conversation. Absolutely. He, he has a lot of thoughts. He, he, he speaks in some really good quotes, and he's really interesting. Um, he's, he's surprisingly humble. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't really... I had to do the background research to look up his record, to look up um, his... Uh, experience in the league to find out that he had coached for six teams in three leagues and had never had a losing season in his entire career. Um, in indoor soccer, in NASL, in USL, he's never had one losing season. In fact, the thing that I kind of left out of my article that I thought was neat was he left the, River, the, um, the Rochester Rhinos um, for two years or three years yeah. to be an assistant for PA Classics. Mm -hmm. And um, w the year that he left, the team tanked immediately. Basically, mostly the same players. Um, they just wouldn't play for the new coach. That guy got fired, and they went out and rehired Bob um, mm -hmm. shortly thereafter. Um, he has th an eye for players. Mm -hmm. uh, he just is able to identify guys, uh, and then he gets the most out of them. When we were talking... We, we talked about the two latest acquisitions that the Hounds have made, uh, Stephen Dos Santos, mm -hmm. Stephen with two E's, mm -hmm. uh, and um, Ryan James. And they were both with players. One. Right. With one. <laughs> and they were both players that he had with the Rhinos. Mm -hmm. And he very clearly thought that they were excellent players and that last year one was in Ottawa, one was in Nashville. That their coaches, their coach, he didn't say it this way in a negative way, but that their coach clearly didn't 
use them right, didn't get the most out of them, didn't see their quality. And I think Bob just thinks he's going to get a guy in and that guy's going to be spectacular for him. In the in the end of last season, I interviewed him about Canardo Forbes, mm-hmm. who is this really, like, calm presence in the midfield. You know, he collects the ball. He has a soft foot. He delivers the ball in the pass with absolute precision. He's very, very... Um, quick at unloading the ball once it comes in, which is perfect for a number 10. Um, and Lily knew it, and, and he just thought, like, well, i got to bring this guy over from, from Rochester. So he has that eye for talent, and then clearly he understands how to build a system that works. Uh, players work really well in the system that he builds, and he finds the players that will work in that mm-hmm. system for him. Yeah, and d- d- if, to break down your article, I don't want to go. If you uh, want to read the article, it's on Pittsburgh Soccer Now. Um, so just feel free to check that out uh, when you get a chance. Shameless plug. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and you know, Lily, you, you mentioned something about he didn't really reveal what his secret sauce is. But I think you're sitting there talking right now. You're sort of trying to come up yeah. with what his and and it's the same thing. Uh, I've watched him for a full year now, up front and in person. Um, you know, uh, many, many in one-on-one interviews with him and just been around him quite a bit. And uh, he just doesn't miss any details. When he says, I, when, when, he doesn't say it again with the humility. Mm-hmm. He doesn't right. say, I know what a good soccer player is and that's why I'm the best. He just very quietly, humbly assembles teams where all the guys work. And they, and they work. The other thing is, you know, Canardo said... Another thing that I dropped into my article was that they want to play for him. They want guys left money on the table in USL because they think they can win a trophy. Like that's a – they don't pay very well in USL. Mm-hmm. So to, to say like I'm going to put it aside and, and go with Bob because I know Bob wins, it's a really neat thing. It, it shows the kind of commitment that both Bob has to his players and the players have to winning. They want to win. And they want to win, and they know that Lily is going to deliver uh, a team that that can win. I wasn't here, you know, a year, two, three years ago when the Riverhounds weren't as successful a team. I know from the basics and the records that they weren't as successful a team, but there is this strong sense that um, they have a winner in Bob Lily. And one of the neat things is is that Pittsburgh sports you know, across the city is in a bit of a down cycle. You know, uh, teams are missing the playoffs. Um, nobody is, none of the big professional teams are doing super well. Pitt's men's basketball team was not very good last year. They're doing better this year. But, um, you know, I think Pittsburgh is casting about for a hero. And I'd say, why not Bob Lilly? Why not Bob Lilly? <laughs> why not the Riverhounds uh, to make some noise? I mean, you know, I, we, I took some thought, but even my soccer playing uh, son corrected me at the yeah, the Penguins probably still had a better season than the Riverhounds last year, but that's about it. I mean, and and so, you know, there was definitely a certain level of excitement that we had here that we hadn't seen, mm-hmm. in, at least during the Highmark Stadium era, for sure. And really, before that, they were playing at high school stadiums, and atmosphere was just didn't really mm-hmm. exist the way, at least it existed when the Highmark Stadium opened in 2013. There was an exciting season, a playoff season, they had a pretty exciting season in 2015, but everything in between is just there was no continuity, there was no consistency. So, um, so with Bob Lilly, we're seeing a, a, a coach. You know, really, we are seeing that one person can really make a difference in terms of running, a, uh, getting a franchise at this level. Yeah, I mean, the, the next the next challenge or the challenge for for any coach is to move from the known knowns to the known unknowns, to paraphrase a famous American politician. So, you know, USL rosters turn over a lot more than Major League Soccer rosters or, you know, Premier League rosters do. Uh, It's just the nature of the beast. Some guys are going to move on. Some guys didn't work out. You know, if you're not a regular starter for a USL team, you really don't want to sit on the bench for a second or a third season waiting for your chance to come. So, at least 50% of a USL roster turns over from year to year. Lily brought back 11, sold off one, and then brought in three more players, I think. So now the roster is at 13. 
He said he wants to be somewhere between 23 and uh, 22 and 24 players, pretty typical mm -hmm. for a USL roster, which means they're going to be bringing in another 10, 12, 13 players between now and opening day, which is March 16th. Um, and that's, that's where the, the devil and the details and the rubber and the road and all the metaphors, right? Like, um, can this, can a coach look at a player who has played either in USL or in Europe or in college soccer and figure out what they're going to be best at for his team, where they're going to fit on the field, um, and is he going to be better at that than 32 other coaches in USL? I mean, that is a, a big challenge. Um, and so for Lilly, he, he made his first uh, big, you know, he, he picked up two signings that we mentioned, James and Dos Santos. Um, he also picked up a Anthony Velarde, who is a Division II soccer player out of Fresno Pacific University. Yep. Um, 44 uh, assists in his career. Right, right. and, a, and a, a really talented, you know, number 10. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would imagine that he's kind of the guy who can um, – spell Canardo Forbes, mm -hmm. or if you wanted to work with something like a, a twin pivot, uh, like a 4-4-2 or a 4-2-3-1, um, you know, Bob Lilly doesn't uh, really stick with one formation, but he does have a system. Um, and so anyways, Velarde could be a really good um, asset to the team. He could be uh, you know, a diamond in the rough. He could just be, you know, a, a solid backup for the team. You don't know. The other thing that goes with with a guy like that is um, the USL schedule last year was pretty rough, and I think this year it's going to be rougher in terms of a lot of two-game-a-week uh, two um, situations where you can't roll out your same 11 guys. They're going to be too exhausted. So you need a little bit of depth, and hopefully Velarde can bring them that. Yeah, I think USL, well, we to, that's another topic for another day, but I think USL <laughs> is claiming it's going to be a little bit better. It's a little bit more spread out. There, I think the Riverhounds have three Wednesday or midweek games this year, which I think is less than last year. But there's some parts in the schedule where it looks like it's it's going to be there's going to be some tough stretches for sure. Um, all right, so in terms of that process, like from my viewpoint, last year watching Bob Lilly work through the preseason, it was it was just unbelievable in terms of what we saw, what we saw, um, how he brought in um, each week about ten you know, nine or ten players on trial probably the first three weeks uh, gave everybody a chance to play probably that using a 60-minute and a 30-minute rotation for a 90-minute scrimmage. Uh, a lot of the starters got the 60 minutes and then played 30. But if you notice the Riverhounds preseason schedule, they're looking at Friday, Sunday, Friday, Sunday, Friday, Sunday. So he, he probably set it up that way so that he could – look at a guy for 60 on Friday and then 30 on Sunday, and then the other guys get the 60 on. And then as the preseason winds down, mm. there might be some guys getting close to the 75 or 90-minute, you know, uh, th as the roster trims down. And it's all about building fitness for the guys that are signed and the guys that are secure. And, of course, it's all about guys fighting for roster spots. And as you t outlined and talked about, I mean, Lily seems to know how to – do that, how to manage a team through a preseason and get those 11 or 12 additional players from all those guys coming in on trial um, and, and find the ones that he wants. Yeah, it's the philosophy of how you would build a USL roster for any given team in the league is an interesting one, right? Mm -hmm. If your team like Nashville, um, last year specifically, um, you're interested in ex-MLS guys, right? Veteran guys who you knew played at a higher level and have still got some gas in the tank. And so a fair amount of teams in the league last year were built out with three or four former MLS players. Um, Richmond did that. Nashville did that. Um, you know, besides U.S., besides MLS players, if you go down to Tampa Bay, they got Joe Cole and a couple other, you know, like you want to build out with older veteran top level players who also might be a box office draw, who also the other piece to that is you might have to pay more. Mm -hmm. um, the other way to go, obviously, is not one that the Riverhounds can go, which is to be a USL 2 team 
to have a, a an adult a bigger club adult club a bigger club an adult club is I something don't know. else. USL kids. two clubs are I think they're U twenty one clubs basically. Yeah, in but some respects. But right, but not to all of them, to, but. to that right. you've got the senior right. club dictating who's on your roster, mm-hmm. and those guys are all 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, so the River Hounds and Bob Lilly go essentially in a third completely different direction, which is find quality within USL, find NCAA players who um, are being overlooked by the rest of the league and bring them in. Um, the, the most interesting thing to me that I learned was how powerful or how important your agent is in this. Um, player agents are the ones who make the first contact mm-hmm. with the Riverhounds. They send them the video, um, and it's up to the Riverhound staff to figure out um, how how they're going to fit into that team or whether they're worthwhile of taking a flyer on. So um, that was an interesting thing to learn. Another thing that was um, interesting to learn was um, how important the combines that Lily runs are. He brings in players for these combines. Mm-hmm. Then they come and they play in these February preseason matches. And Lily really wants those his players, these, these guys who come in yeah. um, through their agent, to play with the current players, to see how they fit into his system and see whether they're going to be a good mix. Yeah, he. I remember him telling me last year, he said he has a, a little piece of paper. He has little notes that he takes at the Combine, and then he has a list of guys that are on this little – I'm sure he's, he's – I don't know how much more elaborate that he has um, – he, who organizes his his uh, player list? I mean, I was when he was in his office. He pretty much had everybody on a on a dry erase board. But he has these little papers uh, with his players, and you know, he from the combines, and he keeps them handy. And I think he's ready to call. I'm sure he probably has already has. Well, he already has that first group that's going to be on trial that'll start Monday. Um, so and he's got some big spots to fill. Uh, yes. He's got to fill basically a backup at every one of yep. the back four. So uh, another left back, another right back, and two more center backs. He probably needs another striker. Mm-hmm. And there's only one goalkeeper on the roster right yep. now, um, Kyle Morton. It seems likely that Kyle Morton goes into camp as the expected number one. But, you know, there's a lot of really good goalkeepers who were not retained in USL. There are a couple of US, uh, MLS goalkeepers who aren't coming back. And then there's all the foreign possibilities of, of guys who, you know, they want to they wanna make a mark in the United States and, and maybe get on the board for the next round of MLS expansions. Uh, so, um, you know, I think that if, if you're a Hounds fan and you're going to come out to some of the preseason games, keep an eye on who starts in goal. Keep an eye on on striker position. I think those are some some interesting things. The midfield, I would say, is pretty much set. I think it's set. I think that, that there's some depth there that they could they, they may find very very late in the preseason. They may if there's you know again that's kind of how Bob works is if there's somebody out there that he knows that can help he might bring in another season midfielder like a Ben Zemanski came in last year right um, and really helped. Uh, and Joe Holland, too. Um, all right, <clears throat> so we're running a little tight on time. Um, y- this is essentially where they are now. The preseason will begin on Monday, uh, February 4th. Uh, they, they're heading in. There's going to be a little media event on Friday. I know you'll be able to get there. I probably will not be. But uh, we're looking forward to um, they're going to ha- be releasing a 20th anniversary logo. Uh, this is the 20th anniversary. I cannot believe it. I remember the day that the, the Riverhounds uh, started so this should be a really exciting season for a lot of reasons. Year two of Bob Lilly, I think we're going to see. I, I can only see the, you know, being in that top three or four for sure. Um, and you know, as you put, this is going to be a wild time with all the uh, the try guys on trial. And I think, and, I, and I think, coming into camp with this expectation, you know, they have a coach who's back for a second year instead of a brand new coach yeah. and a brand new coaching staff. And I think they've laid it down, you know. Um, it feels like they fell short last year. It mm-hmm. feels like the first round exit from the playoffs was not what they were banking on. Mm-hmm. It was they they thought that they could at least make a run to the Eastern Conference final. Um, so to have a goal in mind, and it's not even February yet with the guys who are coming back, that's a really good place to start. 
Well, Mark, thank you uh, for coming down here. It's uh, we could sit here and talk soccer all day. I Always. Mean, this is just there's so many topics to cover. Um, so if we can't do it here, we'll do it on Pittsburgh Soccer Now, where we have lots of content. Um, so uh, be sure to visit Pittsburgh Soccer Now. And uh, again, thank you for coming. It's been uh, it's been wonderful. And uh, stay warm out there. Go Hounds. Yeah.